Welcome back, fellow Sojourners, to another edition of Appropriate in the Culture. On today's episode, we are continuing on our series of awkward conversations. This is awkward. And this might be the most awkward of them all, so parental warnings all around, viewer discretion is advised, because today we're going to be talking about how far is too far, premarital and marital chastity in regards to extracurricular sexual activity like, you know... Oral sex, anal sex, mutual masturbation, cunnilingus. So heed that parental warning. Don't forget to blush as we have another and hopefully the final awkward conversation. Good gravy, this is awkward. I'm Pastor Shane. I might lose my job soon as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> So two weeks ago, we talked about premarital sex and the biblical basis for regarding premarital sex as sinful. And then last week, we looked at the prevalence of porn. We didn't look. We discussed pornography and the harmful effects of it in our culture. And today's topic is a kind of combination therein. With the prevalence of porn in our society, and heck, even apart from porn, with just the sexual displays permitted in modern television and movies, people are exposed to a litany of sexual activity that is beyond traditional intercourse. Course. And this has produced a whole host of mystifying views about what constitutes sex. In 1998, President Bill Clinton famously said, I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. And because of impeachment and perjury charges, our nation was plunged into a long and bizarre discussion about whether oral sex is sex, despite the fact that sex is right there in the name. But many studies, even from the time period, have shown that our culture is not entirely clear what it means as sex. A study in 1991 among 600 students at a Midwestern university found that 59% of people surveyed did not believe that oral sex would qualify as sex. 19% thought the same about anal sex. Females. 62% were more likely than males, 56%, to assert that cunnilingus and fellatio were not sex. In a fall 1999 survey conducted by Seventeen magazine, 49% surveyed considered oral sex to be not as big a deal as sexual intercourse, and 40% said it did not count as sex. In another study in which students were asked which acts would define a sexual partner, they were less likely to say that a couple would consider one another as sexual partners if they had oral sex than if they had vaginal or anal intercourse. No, no, not a sexual partner, just really good friends. And another study of over a thousand college freshmen and sophomores surveyed found that 61% considered mutual masturbation to orgasm to be abstinent behavior. 37% described oral intercourse as abstinence, and 24% thought the same about anal intercourse. In a 1999 email survey of 72 health educators, 30% responded that oral sex was abstinent behavior. Hello, darkness, my old no, I, no, I'm done. This is stupid. Appropriate in the Culture is brought to us by The Dictionary. Are you curious as to what words mean or how to define things? That's where The Dictionary comes in. Turn to any word, like say the word abstinence, and you will find that abstinence is the fact or practice of restraining oneself from indulging in something. So for instance, if you're abstaining from alcohol, it doesn't really matter if it's wine or beer or spirits. The Dictionary, know what words mean. Alrighty, so I think part of the reason why you see so much confusion in our society over even basic things like defining sex and abstinence is because they're defining it without a moral framework. And because of that, it becomes reduced to something very technical. And I, I didn't have vaginal intercourse, and so technically I'm still a virgin, even if I've had multiple sexual experiences with people. And because of that technicality, the sexual activity takes on a hierarchical structure. So this sexual activity is more more intimate, or less intimate, or more important, or less important. But morality is not a technicality. The Christian life is about godliness and righteousness. You know, virginity is often an analogy for holiness and purity. But because of that, sometimes virginity can be twisted as being the goal. But virginity is not the goal. Holiness and purity is the goal of the Christian walk. And there have been plenty of Christian men and women who were technically virgins on their wedding day, but were far from sexually righteous in getting there. 
and that misses the mark. And whether you miss the mark wide or short, it doesn't matter that much. Morality is not a technicality. And the clear indication from scripture is that sex is only righteous within the confines of marriage, and so the moral framework applies to all activity that could be characterized as sexual. In which case, the non-married Christian should engage in abstinence. Focus on the Family provides a sensible definition of sexual abstinence, which is, our definition is refraining from all sexual activity, which includes intercourse, oral sex, anal sex, and mutual masturbation. Makes sense. Those are all clearly sexual acts, and so if you're abstaining from sex, that encompasses all of those. Just like abstaining from alcohol would encompass beer, wine, hard booze, and anything with alcohol. So there is no sense in which intercourse, oral sex, anal sex, or mutual masturbation is righteous outside of the context of marriage. But are those sexual actions even righteous within the context of marriage? Chastity and sexual purity is not simply a concern for unmarried people, but for married people too. But you might be shocked to find that the Bible does not really talk about oral sex, anal sex, or mutual masturbation in the context of heterosexual Christian marriage. And because of that, there's disagreement in Christian circles. On the one hand, you have people like Mark Driscoll, who claimed that the Song of Songs depicts things like oral sex, which probably says more about Mark Driscoll than it does the Song of Solomon. But on the other hand, you have our Catholic brothers and sisters who hold that any male climax that occurs without a reasonable shot of procreation is a mortal sin, the highest level of sin, and so you better find a priest to confess to. The Catholic Exchange site summarizes this position fairly well. All sexual activity, i.e. foreplay, is ordered fulfillment in sexual intercourse, i.e. a completed sexual act. Hence, activities such as bringing the husband to orgasm without intercourse through mutual masturbation is gravely immoral. Most Catholic moralists agree, some do not, but reasonable minds can differ on non-definitive matters that oral sex is licit as a form of foreplay. In other words, as long as oral sex is not sought for itself, but is a part of a total act that is ordered to and is completed in intercourse, it is morally licit. So those are permissible things in the context of marriage so long as it's just foreplay. And that makes sense with a Catholic framework, which also holds that contraception is morally impermissible because it separates sex from its procreative purpose. They explain it this way. Lust is disordered desire for or inordinate enjoyment of sexual pleasure. Sexual pleasure is morally disordered when sought for itself, isolated from its procreative and unitive purposes. And as a good Catholic, you can't have inordinate enjoyment. Protestants tend to differ on this issue because when it comes to sexual morality, we put a little more weight in the authority of scripture and a little less weight on the writings of unmarried men who've never had sex just because maybe, possibly, they're not the world's leading experts on the subject. So what does the Bible say on the matter? Not much. Uh, Catholics will usually point to two things, God's command to be fruitful and multiply, and this account from Genesis. Then Judas said to Onan, sleep with your brother's wife and fulfill your duty to her as a brother-in-law to raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the child would not be his. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he spilled his semen on the ground to keep from providing offspring for his brother. What he did was wicked in the Lord's sight, so the Lord put him to death also. So Catholics will say this is sex isolated from the procreative purpose, and that's wicked, and it applies to us universally. Protestants will say, no, this is particular, not universal, because, for instance, Christians are under no moral obligation to marry the widows of our brothers. So it's a different situation, a different circumstance that doesn't apply to us. The entire purpose of this cultural custom, which was later codified in the Mosaic Law, was to produce offspring for the deceased so that they wouldn't lose their inheritance. Onan is acting selfishly and greedily and is mistreating his wife, who we can reasonably infer would want a child. And that's not exactly the same thing as a married Christian couple prudentially planning their family through mutual consent. Procreation is a purpose of sex, but it isn't the sole purpose of sex, which both Catholics and Protestants agree. 
But to me, I would be more sympathetic to the Catholic position if it were more consistently applied. There's all kinds of sex that is isolated from procreation that Catholics have no problem with. Catholics have no problem with postmenopausal women having sex with their spouse. Catholics have no problem with infertile married couples having sex. Catholics have no problem with the rhythm method and natural planning, which basically means you look at her cycle and have sex on the day she's not likely to get pregnant. And that's where you completely lose me as a Protestant, because it's the same motive. It's the same heart, which is, I want to have sex, but I don't want to get pregnant, so I'm going to use my understanding of the natural world in order to prevent that. It's the same thing. Oh, well, you know, you, you could still get pregnant, you know, using the rhythm method. Yeah, but you can always still get pregnant. Uh, people with vasectomies have gotten pregnant. Uh, babies have been born despite IUDs. We're talking about God here. If he wants you to have a baby, the birth control is not going to matter. And the heart is always the key issue when it comes to righteousness and holiness. I want to have sex, but I don't want to have a baby, so I'm going to use my understanding of the natural world in order to prevent that. That's the same motive. That's the same heart behind contraception or the rhythm method. And so that heart is either sinful or not. Because again, morality is not a technicality. And that's really the driving principle. Sexual purity in Christian marriage is not a simple list of do's and don'ts because the Bible provides us no such list. And where the Bible is silent, we should tread lightly. And Christians in good standing can disagree on these issues. The good news is uh, we shouldn't have a problem with judging one another because we should all have no idea about what's going on in someone else's bedroom. But I would say not all sexual actions or all instances of sex are righteous just because it happens to happen in the confines of marriage. And some sexual actions might be fine for one couple that are not fine for another. Don't violate your conscience. Be convinced in your own mind. There's a debate about the moral permissibility of things like oral sex, BDSM, mutual masturbation in the context of marriage because the Bible doesn't really speak on it. But what is abundantly clear is that those are sexual acts and so Christians of all stripes, Protestant and Catholic alike, universally agree that that is immoral outside of marriage. All right, we're done. If I'm not fired, I need a raise. Uh, let me say I, I've been receiving a lot of great feedback uh, regarding what we've been doing here, so thank you for that. I really appreciate all your comments and support. If you want to spread the word about this, uh, be sure to share on the usual social media. If you want to follow me, you can catch me on my author's page, uh, Nathan Shane Miller on Facebook, or at in Shane Miller on Twitter, and at NSMiller on Locals. And I'll see you right here next week for more Appropriating the Culture. <laughs>